a pleasure to be with you guys. I've been here once before, and I give lots of lectures all over the world, but I truly remember the one to the students at APS Kingdom of Home Energetics. So thank you for having me again. My name is Pankaj Gupta. This is my city. I grew up in New Delhi in the 70s. I lived for 20 years in the US, was educated at the University of Virginia, and then at Yale University. I'm a practicing architect. It just so happens the reason I need to bolt out of here after telling you about this is because I go into that room my firm is designing hopefully a very cool remodel for Parkview Middle School District. But with, without any further delay, let me get started. What is the Yamuna River Project? Seven years ago, I was asked by the Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia to come and join the faculty as a professor of architecture. And she said, bring with you, bring with you to us the most pressing dilemma, the most challenging problem that you as a designer think you need to solve. And her anticipation was, I would bring with me a museum project, or an office building, or a school, because that's what we do. As Beer Miller Architects, which I'm a founding partner of, we're designing a museum, Kobolainu's Tomb, the first museum in India on a World Heritage Site. I'm designing a new remodel for the AES, your building. But what I, what I really wanted to do, and use this professorship to do, was use the resources of an American research university, which is a real powerhouse, and start to address questions that are very challenging for people to address anywhere in the world, but especially in New Delhi. How do you take a city of 20 million people and reconnect this city and its people with a very important geographic predecessor to the founding of the city, its only river, the Yamuna? So that became my kind of mission at UVA, and now I'm proud to say in seven years, the Yamuna River Project is the largest multidisciplinary research project ever undertaken at the University of Virginia. We have 16 professors from eight different departments like engineering, public health, life sciences, environmental sciences, of course, architecture. And we are looking at this problem with a view to addressing similar situations all over the world. So let me tell you a little bit about how we got started. We started looking at the city. And you can see these are images of the old fort where now you have the Delhi Zoo. Any of you been to Delhi Zoo or the old fort? Yeah, okay, so this is, this is what it looked like, and these are some of the earliest drawings of that. But, but one of the most amazing things was, this was built here because the river Yamuna was flowing right here. They needed the river to float the boats that would carry these large stones that would build the fort. So the river was also a highway. It was actually the essential lifeline for the building of the city. This is a really beautiful etching we found uh, many years ago in the British Library in London. And it shows you, this is Shah Jahanabad, the emperor Shah Jahan, who built the Red Fort. Um, this is the city, and here is the Yamuna. And you can see already the army garrison and this British encampment starting to, to take place here. And you can see these rivulets. These are the channels, the Himalayan streams that were perennial, that brought water into Shah Jahanabad, which was then the city of Delhi. And the, the, the most amazing thing we found when we analyzed this drawing was that the emperor's palace was the last house in the city to get water from the river. That's how clean it was. That's how amazingly pure the water channels were, that they could flow through the entire city, giving water to every citizen before arriving at the Red Fort, the emperor's palace. That's not the case today. Today, this is what it looks like. You have the Yamuna River, which is coming from the Himalayan snow melt. And at Wazirabad, which is about 15 kilometers north of where we're sitting, the entire river is dammed. And all of the water, 100% of the water, is taken out and piped to a water treatment plant and then piped to your homes and your schools and your offices. So what happens? How would we have a river if 100% of the water is taken out? Anyone guess? Any guesses? Yeah. Sewage. Sewage. What we do, we take all the water, we, we, and then we put back in the, in the river untreated sewage. So everything that's flowing past Wazirabad, through the city of Delhi, beyond Delhi to Okra, from Okra to Mathura, Mathura to Agra, is raw sewage. Chemical effluent, agricultural runoff, untreated sewage. That's our river, which means what? it cannot support any life. No fish, no birds, no aquatic plants. So this is essentially a dead river. And 
this is the comparison. Here is, a, is, is an etching from 1860, where the, the river was considered a mirror to the city. That's how important the relationship of the city and the river was. That the emperors and the royalty believed that the beauty of their city was commensurate with the purity of the river. And this is that same site today. This is a photograph I took six years ago. What did we do? We dumped all our effluent, our sewage treatment, our toxic waste producing cement plants, our coal burning power plants, and we basically cut off the river from you, from the people who live in the city. And that is the tragedy of the Amazon. You can see from here, this is the Wazir of Do you see the color of the water? Yeah? What does it look like? Clean, right? That's essentially potable water. That's clean water that you can pretty much with minor treatment drink. Here's where the barrage takes the water away to this water treatment plant. And this is the Nagarkar drain. Now, many years ago, in the 70s and 80s, when I was a boy, the Nagarkar drain was not a drain. It was a river. It was one of the Amazon rivulets called the Sahibi River. And this rivulet was perennial. And I remember people used to go duck hunting and, and do bird watching. But in the last 20, 30 years, as the population of Delhi mushroomed, and proper urban planning didn't take place, all the untreated sewage of places like Gurgaon and West Delhi goes right into this drain. And this one drain, which is 58 kilometers long, starts to spew all its effluent right there. Do you see that? <coughs> and believe it or not, the entire length of the Yamuna River, from the Himalayas to the sea, 70% of the pollution of the entire river comes right into this drain. That's how dramatic this is. That if we could treat all the toxic sewage and effluent in one drain, we wouldn't just clean the river in Delhi. We would remove 70% of the pollution of the entire river in the country, in the entire length of the Yamuna River. So that became the challenge for us. I know I don't have too much time, but I will walk you through. What we started doing was mapping sites in the city where most of the untreated sewage is being put into that drain and hence into the Yamuna. Why do you think this happens? Do you think people don't have flushes? They don't want to go to toilets? What do you think is the reason for this? Yeah? Wastes. That's industrial waste, that's factory effluent, but sewage is essentially urine and fecal matter. And one of the most amazing revelations to us in our research was this is a problem with housing. We had over six million people in the city of Delhi living in slums. And no matter what you do, you cannot connect a sewage network to a slum. First, you have to provide proper housing. And so this was a real revelation to us that this kind of condition of the Yamuna floodplain before it gets to Delhi, bucolic, filled with birds, relatively clean water, this is the origins of the Sahibi River, the Nagarkar Drain. How does it look like this? This image is garbage just two weeks old. Every two weeks, a tractor comes and bulldozes all this trash from this entire slum into the river. Right? You see proper houses, you see people driving cars who live here, but that's where they live. Because we haven't designed our city properly. We forgot that when you have people, they need places to live. Those places to live are tethered to infrastructure. Electricity, water, sewage. So what do we do as the Yamuna River Project? You guys can go check out our website, the theyamunaRiverProject.org. Then we produced a book on our research, which is in your library. Um, and what we did was we said, let's put all this work that we're doing, all these facts that we're finding, let's put them in the public domain, which is what we started to do. We started to involve embassies, schools, diplomats, corporations, foundations, and just said, listen, how are you gonna clean the river when your system of governance is so complex like this? You can't, because there are 27 different agencies who control where you clean the trash, where you treat sewage, who cleans the drain, where the roads are built, why you're not building housing. 
So first, it's a governance problem. You've got to simplify how things are managed. We also started showing people that for a thousand years, the Yamuna River has been the source of so much aesthetic and cultural and philosophical meaning to Indian civilization. These, that's the rendition of the Yamuna. You see the little turtle at the bottom? That's the Yamuna, goddess Yamuna River, in a, in a, feet, in a sculpture that's almost a thousand years old. So we have art history professors who are filling in the blanks of how this cultural presence has been lost. We have environmental engineers who are saying there is no computer model right now that can tell you how to treat this much pollution. That's how bad the pollution is. We don't know how you do toxic remediation for this level of contamination. This is a kind of scary drawing. Everything that's red is forest or tree or floodplain. Everything that's blue or green is actually concrete. And what we realized in our research is that from 1991 to 2016, basically we decimated so much of Delhi's green cover. Everything shown in red is forest here into 1991. Look how much of it has disappeared in 2016. And if we continue at this rate, within the next 10 to 12 years, we will have no groundwater left in this city. This city will be incapable. At that point, it would be cheaper to have trucks powered by diesel or petrol bringing in water from somewhere else. That's how bad the situation is. We look at the flooding situation. If you have a cli because of climate change, global warming. Yes. I just, uh, just a question. What what is the relation between having so many trees and the groundwater level? Why is why is that related? So what what happens is when you have green cover, your tree cover or foliage, when it rains, the precipitation is allowed to percolate into the ground and recharge the aquifers. That's why it's so important. But what we do is when we cut those trees, when we remove those forests, when we build kind of urban uh, concrete jungles around, then when it rains, all that water just flows off the concrete, comes into contact with sewage and untreated waste on the streets and the drains, and actually becomes dirty. And then it actually adds to the contaminant, as opposed to being absorbed and filtered and fed to the aquifers. So how much time do I have, Michael? Five more minutes? Okay, so I'm gonna go quickly through. Um, what we started to look at is what are the signs of hope? We looked at Barcelona. Any of you been to Barcelona? Yeah, pretty amazing city, right? Well, 30 years ago, Barcelona didn't have a beach. 30 years ago, all of the Barcelona coast to the Mediterranean Sea was industry and effluent, cement factories, dumping ground, shipping containers. So the citizens of Barcelona didn't know that they could go to the beach and bathe in the sea. But thanks to the Olympics, 1992, they had three architects who, be, who were elected to the city council, and one architect became a mayor. And he decided that he would use his architectural training to change the city's relationship to its coastline using the Olympic money as an excuse. So during the Olympics, look at what happened. All this industry got relocated, all the highways got put underground, and a huge park system with public beaches public promenades was built. And today, you have one of the most extraordinarily beautiful urban coastal edges of any city in the world. So we said, why couldn't Delhi have the same aspiration? Can we not recreate the, the city as an eco-forest embrace, with the Yamuna being its spinal cord, with the Najafgarh again being the Sahili River cleaned of the effluent, and so you would start to attract flora and fauna and people living would have access to this green space. And so we've done a range of projects that, I'm gonna skip through this, that talk about how you clean a drain and what do you do when you clean the drain. So obviously you remove the garbage and sewage, you provide proper housing so people have proper toilets and that toilet flush goes into a treatment plant. But then you also create public space. So we imagine that that toxic drain becomes a greenway, a mobility spine. People bike and they walk and that connects to the river. You start to upgrade all this housing. You start to make parks within the city. And so what looks like this right now, this is a typical drain. There are hundreds of these drains in Delhi, actually over 200 miles of drains in the city. These start to become redesigned as public walkways and parks. Why? Because they only have water two months of the year during the monsoon. The rest of the year they're dry. So you can actually walk on them. 
you can build new housing and public infrastructure on the edges instead of letting slum clusters develop without any proper planning. We also looked at how you could take derelict sites, which are really uh, isolated and drop dumping grounds for trash, and start to connect them into a network of park systems. Why? Exactly for this reason that we talked about earlier, to allow rain to fall and be absorbed into the ground and recharge the aquifers. And then we said, wouldn't it be amazing if on Republic Day, which is happening in two days, when the president and the prime minister and all these guys come marching down India Gate, to look at the parade and the sit here. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could reconnect that entire sequence of public parks on Rajpan from India Gate all the way past the Purana Kila, the Red Fort, and the zoo back to the other end? So that ceremonial procession would right a historical wrong, which would be the reorienting of the city to the river as opposed to against it. So one last question for you guys. Why do you think the city cut itself off from the river. Any guesses? Anyone study history? Logic. Because for centuries, all of the Mughals had built parallel to the river. The Red Fort is up there, right next to the river. Humayun's tomb is down here, right next to the river. Purana Kila is here next to the river. So why do you think the city of New Delhi turned its back to the river? so children from schools like you could go and visit. We're trying to say taking Purana Kila and Pirocha Kotla, these historic monuments that once were on the banks of the river, let's make great new public space so people start to understand the relationship of the history and archaeology of the city with the river. Let's make new water treatment plants which are open to the public so they're not mysterious things behind tall walls, but they're places that anyone can go and see and so have a sense of awareness of how how much waste you generate, how it needs to be treated, and how that treatment is done so that the water and the river is still clean for the people further downstream. We want to design botanical gardens and river parks along the flood plain to be able to absorb the rain and recharge the groundwater, but also allow people to understand that there's an ecology that is off the river and for the river that needs to be at the river. And then we want to provide community and public infrastructure on these derelict sites that right now are abandoned cement plants and storage areas and bus depots and let people of the city, the 22 million people who have 
have very little access to green space, reconnect with green space. We want to do proper housing instead of slums so that all this can be networked to a sewage system. We want to design bazaars and markets on bridges. Right now, you can't walk across the bridge on the river. It's all designed for traffic. So we want those bridge designs to change so you can walk to a market facing the water where people can play because the water's clean. We want to design proper cremation grounds and crematoria along the river, as opposed to now where sometimes the bodies are burned right on the banks. And we want to restore all the wetlands and the marshes that are on the banks of the river that have now become dumping grounds for illicit construction material or construction debris. That's how you make a smart city. You take the living systems, which are foliage, flora, fauna, you take the water systems, because water is essential, and you take the energy systems. And when you intersect them in a holistic way, that's what you get. That's a smart city. And these are examples of other cities in the world that are already doing this. This is in Madrid. This is in Saragossa, in Spain. This is a project that we are doing for an academic campus where we're using foliage and tree planting to lower ambient air temperature. This is a project we're proposing for the city of Mumbai to restore the Mumbai Miti River with public pedestrian bridges. I think that tells me my time is over. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there any questions for a couple of minutes? I'm happy to answer, otherwise I will answer in a few minutes. Maybe just a few questions, because we questions. have to get two more. Okay. Yeah, so two questions. Sure. has a budget of about $100 million a year. But how is that $100 million spent? Very, very little of it actually spent on new infrastructure or upgrading infrastructure. It's spent on basically doing piecemeal repair work to a network of pipes that is already 30 or 40 or 50 years old. And what we're saying is this is such a national priority that what the government needs to do is first make a proper plan and, and plan for the next 30, 40 years and it's not money that you spend on one, in one fell swoop in one day. You actually start to upgrade the entire network of water supply and sanitation infrastructure. And you make a 10 year plan. One of the challenges and problems with that is politicians are not elected for 10 years. They're elected for five years. And they spend a lot of money trying to get elected. So once they're elected, they want to do things that can be done in two, three years, which can then be talked about for the next two years and get them reelected. Very difficult to push projects that require a really long term thing. Okay, last question. Yeah? Um, I'm assuming that you're, you're probably going to be targeting the government, but what has already been done in New York so far to help? So I'll answer both sides of your question. So we're already, we're trying to push the government to at least read our book to confront this research and make better policy. The problem is anytime we go and meet the people in the government, they're like, can you give us the one page summary? Because no one has the patience to go through a 300 page book and really understand the complexity. What is already being done, I think, is quite piecemeal because um, to make a complete city plan, to make a holistic, ecological, urban design and infrastructure plan would require a real commitment and the, and the creation of a kind of single point authority that says, okay, we're gonna push this forward. And that's, unfortunately, in our democracy, that's very difficult to pull off. But I am optimistic that the more public pressure that is put on the government, for instance, now the government is really feeling pressure to clean the air, because the air quality issues have become huge. We feel that if in the next year or two or three, the water becomes a similarly urgent priority, then the public pressure is what's gonna force the government to do it. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you so much.